epistle lesson for, for the second Sunday in Advent. Romans uh, chapter 15. I think it starts in verse, does it start in verse 3? Four. Well, yep, four. That's what I have underlined, four. Romans four, 15, 15, four. Everybody there? Can't get online. They make these things, Steph. They look like this. Always online. They're always, always online. So, I'm sorry. I was, I was up late last night. I went to that wonderful game last night. Did you guys, did you guys do need a moment of silence? Or? <laughs> Romans 15. Let's go. Romans 15, verse 4 through 13. Verse 4 through 13. Romans 15, verse 4 through 13. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. So that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. So that with one heart and one mouth, you may glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercies as it is written. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. Again, it says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, it says, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you people. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up One who will arise to rule over all the nations, the Gentiles will hope in him. In verse 13, close out this portion, it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, that you may trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your word. Uh, We thank you and praise you that through the scriptures we may find hope. Lord, I pray this morning that is what will happen in our hearts and our minds, Lord, that we will be fixed on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah, this morning I want to talk to you just for a few minutes about hope. Um, it, it's, it's quite interesting. I, I really have over the last few weeks just been um, pondering and wondering and thinking and, and dwelling on this, this whole idea of hope. Hope is one of my favorite topics. I'm big on hope. Um, I often have misguided hope. You are very, very, very optimistic all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those guys, when you have an idea, I think it's a great idea. And I think we can accomplish it. And if it takes 15 guys, I'm pretty sure we could do it with seven. You know, just always high on hope. One time, I don't know if I shared this with you, one time I had a friend in town, one of my good friends, Brent Fraser, drove all the way up from Florida to hang out with us. Um, and this was the same weekend that we were starting to move the school over to, to Gar Memorial. And he said, hey, what are we going to do this weekend? I said, well, listen, we're going to have a great time. We're going to hang out. But we need to go over. It's only going to take a couple hours on Saturday morning and go help move the school. And I'm pretty sure we were here almost 10 hours moving desks and whiteboards and books. Goodness gracious, so many books. Thank God for the technology age where you don't have to carry all those books. And he was not as hopeful or my hope didn't pan out so well for him. And it was probably one of the most expensive dinners. Do you remember we had to take them out for dinner and treat them really nicely and, and apologize profusely for um, their faith and my misguided hope? And that's how a lot of my life goes. A lot of my life is, is built on this idea that, um, of hope. And, and un- unfortunately, it, it just keeps building because often, um, <clears throat> most of the time, maybe not more often than not, but at least a little better, maybe like 51% of the time, it works. It works, even in my own life. But as we read the scriptures, the good news is that God deals in hope. And his hope always works. It's not like my hope. It's not, it's not hoping in my abilities, but it is, is hoping in God. And so this morning I want to take just a few minutes and, and pour over these scriptures and just talk about it from here. What is the idea of hope? Where does it come from? How do we get it? How do we hold on to it? How do we walk in this? How do we step into this whole idea of hope. And it's interesting, in verse 4, it starts out with this. It says, for everything that was written in the past was to teach us so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have, let's let's try that again, we might have, 
One of the places that I, I don't think we often realize that we can gain hope, that we can have hope, that we begin, begin to build up hope in our, in our lives is through the Scriptures. See, as we read the Scriptures, it should draw us closer to God. As we read the Scriptures, we should understand who, uh, uh, more about who God is and what He has for us and what He has called us to, and it should build hope in our lives. When I was thinking about this and reading this part about the Scriptures this, and, and thinking about Advent and waiting for Jesus to come, these people were filled with hope waiting on this baby boy to come. You know where a lot of that hope came from? The Old Testament. And reading about the prophecies and the promises of how this Messiah was to come. And what this Messiah would do. And how he would walk and how he would save. As we pour over the scriptures. As we let the scriptures begin to envelop our hearts and our minds and, and flow out of our mouths. Hope should build. And I can't help but wonder is during this Advent season how many of us struggle with hope. Sometimes it's, it's a hard season, actually, for us. The holidays and just the, uh, you know, the wear and tear of, of, of the culture and the holidays and family. And sometimes, you know, hanging out with your family for that long isn't always exciting, right? You see too much of them. They say family are like fish. Was that? Yeah. Family are like fish. After three days, they begin to smell a little bit. Have you heard that? Is that not true? No, I'm sorry. We, we'll talk about that in staff, huh? Told you it was a late night. And I completely lost my focus. But during the season, we often struggle with hope. And I wonder, is, is some of that because we aren't pouring over the Scriptures? We're not letting the Scriptures uh, envelop us and, and control us and take over our lives and, and take, take over our thoughts and, and relying and remembering on the promises of God. Advent, we celebrate the coming of Jesus and we are hopeful for His return. And the scriptures tell us that he's coming back. And as, as we pour over them, that should give us hope, knowing that the promises of God are always yes and amen. So that during the season, not only do we remember his birth, but we celebrate and we hope for his coming again. So as we pour over the scriptures, we begin to grow in our hope. Another thing is, verse 5, it says, May the God who gives endurance... And encouragement give you the spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart you may glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think one of the things that in my life that I have seen time and time again that God uses is the community of believers to build hope in my life. That when we're hurting and we're struggling, we have people we can reach out to that will encourage us. And love on us and point us to who God is and point us to the things Jesus has spoken, that the Holy Spirit has spoken to us, that has spoken to our church. As we begin to unite ourselves as one body, we begin to develop this hope because it's the hope of Jesus Christ pouring out in us as we communicate to each other. Because often what we do is, is, is we, when we're struggling, we tend to hide. We tend to hole up by ourselves. We tend to, you know, throw the earphones on and not talk and just try and hide in our own world. But that's not how Christ decided things should be done. That's not how God designed things to be done. He designed them to be done together and to be done in the community so that when we do struggle, we have a place to go. And the other is true that when you're not struggling and, and you're full of hope and hope is not a struggle for you in this season and you're full of the joy of the Lord and it's overflowing, we're going to talk about that in a minute, it's meant to be overflowing in your life for others. So that as a community, we need to be aware. We shouldn't always have to wait on those who are hurting and struggling to come to us. We shouldn't have to be waiting on them. They shouldn't have to come pound on our door and say, hey, I'm hurting, I'm hurting, I'm hurting. We should be aware and we should... Be in tune with what's going on around us and begin to reach out to them. Knowing that this season might be tough or the next season might be tough or they're just having a hard time or they've been through rough times, we should be aware. Because it says, may God who gives us endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves. And unity goes both ways. So hope is built through the scriptures. It's, it's built through unity as we begin to 
come together, as we begin to rely on each other, as we begin to provide for each other like they did in Acts. I also think hope is built through endurance. In the beginning of this in chapter, in verse 4, it says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures we may have hope. It says in verse 5, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and one mouth you may glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's something about enduring that begins to build hope. Verse 7 says this, it says, accept one another just as Christ has accepted you. Just as Christ has accepted you. When, when I was reading this and, and, and just pondering in my heart uh, the times in my life where I've had endurance and, and, and I've gone through things and had to persevere through things and some of the hope that I've seen come out of that because I've seen God provide over and over in those dark times where I just don't think that it's going to happen, those last minute times where God just comes through and shows himself so faithful and self so glorious and self so holy in my life. But I realized that endurance that I had through that, that pushing through and that perse perseverance began to cause my hope to rise. And the thing is, that is the example that Jesus set for us. Because you can't build hope on your own. You can't just decide I'm going to be hopeful. It doesn't work out that well. If you decide you're just going to be hopeful, you're going to end up here on a Saturday morning thinking it's only going to take two hours. It's going to take you ten hours to move something. When we begin to just build our own hope and our own endurance, that's how things turn out. But when we begin to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, right? In Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 it says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out, fixing our eyes on, on Jesus. That's where that endurance begins to come. We remember that cross that he bore for us. It says, Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And here's the part I want to point out. It says, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Considered him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and you will not lose heart. Endurance, as we fix our eyes on Jesus, remembering what it is that he did for us. And not just that he did it, that he begrudgingly did it, he endured it, did it says for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Often we struggle with endurance because we're focused on ourselves. And this says we need to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy before him endured the cross. I, I, I think that endurance often, uh, we, we, we view it as a place where we just have to grit our teeth and just make it through. And that just barely push through. Sometimes that is the case, but I often think there's a place where we can endure and still have joy. And still have hope. It's if we're willing to fix our eyes on Jesus. If we're willing to fix our eyes on eternity. And fix our eyes on the salvation that he has given us. And fix our eyes on the forgiveness and the mercy and the grace that he's poured out. But often when we're enduring, we're enduring and we're saying, oh, woe is me. Why me? Why am I having to go through this? And we're focused so much on that moment right there and right then. You know, during Advent, like I said, we celebrate the coming of Jesus. And then at that time, what they were doing was hoping for him to come. Hoping for something to come, right, in the future. Not, not right they were hoping for Jesus Christ to come, and he was born, as he said. During Advent, we're celebrating the hope of Jesus Christ coming and returning again. If you're in a place where you're struggling well, and, and, and you're in that enduring phase of hope, and what you need to do is remember and look towards the future of what God will do as he begins to take you through these times and, and sees you through these times and meets you in the valley and begins to take you up to the mountaintop, looking forward to what is to come. It says, accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you <clears throat> that Christ became a servant for the Jews. I think as we begin to serve people, we begin to see the places that we can help. And we begin to see the places where 
people need hope and that where we can begin to help them build up their hope. That's part of what I think what unity is all about is that we are like Christ, right? That for the joy before us, he's, he's sacrificed everything. For the joy before us, we should sacrifice for one another, serving one another and building that unity. I was sharing a staff the other day. Um, the, the last part of this, this uh, epistle lesson, which is really interesting. I think the last couple of times I have um, shared off the lessons, um, it's ended up being one of the verses that, that we um, say over our kids. And this is one of ours. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the, one of the verses we read over our kids. We read it over Emma. And uh, every night when I read this verse, there's one word that always stands out to me. Can you guess? There's one, two, three, four. How many, can you guess which word stands out? No, it's not hope. Sorry. I know that it's confusing because the sermon is about hope. And... It says, may the God of hope fill you with oh. all joy. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. And right after that, it says, so that you trust him so that you may overflow. That you may overflow with hope. God is not in the business of making you just squeak by. He's not in the business of just giving you barely enough joy so that you survive Monday or bedtime or the school carpool line or your work or relationships. He's not in the business of just giving you enough that you squeak by. It says that he desires to fill you with all joy and all peace so that you may overflow in hope. And I wonder how often we get in the way of that because we begin to focus on ourselves instead of fixing our eyes on Jesus. When we begin to fix our eyes on him, as it says in Hebrews, it says that we fix our eyes on the one, the author and perfecter. He's the author who started our life, and he's the perfecter of our life, the one who wants to give us all joy and all peace. So this week, I, I want to challenge you during this time. I think part of this is that we need to stop, and we need to take a minute or several minutes. Because as December rolls on, so does every single day, it seems like. Today is today, and tomorrow's gone before even tomorrow starts, it seems like. And your calendars are going to get full between Christmas parties and kids' plays and, you know, different things that might be going on during this Christmas season. And you're going to go to the mall, and you're going to start shopping, and you're going to get on Amazon, and you're going to start shopping, and before you know it, it's going to be midnight, and you haven't met with the Lord. And you wonder why you're losing hope and why you're losing steam and why you're losing joy and why you're losing peace and why you're not overflowing. Make no mistake, it is God who gives us hope. It is the work of Jesus Christ on the cross that gives us hope. But if we don't stop, and if we don't dig into his word, and if we don't stop and dig into our relationship with him, if we don't stop and dig into our relationship with one another, and we let the season go by, you'll miss that opportunity that Jesus wants to fill you with all joy and with all peace so that you may overflow in hope, not just squeak by, not just get by, but that you would overflow in hope as you walk through this season. I want to leave you with one last thing. My son, we, he, he likes to pray. He's a big prayer. It's, it's quite interesting. It's about the only time he talks quiet. Most of the time he's yelling and he's screaming and hollering at you know the top of his lungs about everything. But whenever he prays, he gets real soft. And I was sharing with staff, whenever he prays, he starts it this way. He said, all, every single time, he says, God, I hope. Every time. Every time. We will pass by an ambulance, and he just starts praying. We, you know, ask him to pray for us if we're not feeling good, or he prays for, you know, school on the way. He goes, God, I hope. And every time he does it, it kind of strikes me. Because 
I believe, even though he probably doesn't fully understand, that's where his heart is. As I hope. That's desperately where I want my heart to be. Is that full of hope and full of understanding. Right? Faith is being certain of what we hope for. You know, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that it's one of the three things that remain, faith, hope, and love. The power of hope in our lives through Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. So I just want to challenge you this week to stop, to dig into his word, to stop and look at the promises that are there and let them fill you with hope, to stop and spend time praying, spend time worshiping the Lord so that you're filled with hope, and stop and spend time with your brothers and sisters in Christ so that you may help them grow in hope and they may help you grow in hope so that we can all persevere together in unity to see the kingdom of God come in this place. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you that you are the author and perfecter of our faith. Lord, I thank you and praise you that you desire to fill us to overflowing. Lord, with all joy and all peace, that we overflow in hope, Lord. That we walk around the city, we walk around our jobs, we walk around everywhere we are, overflowing with the hope of Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, our Savior, our Lord. And I pray that each of us this, this week, this month, as, as we celebrate Advent and celebrate your birth, that we will stop and we will be with you. We will be with one another. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.